So good afternoon, parents, students, and uh, newbie education partner boarding school representatives. My name is Anne Maria Bebe, and I'm the student placement manager at Newbie Education. I'm also going to be the moderator for this virtual information session. Um, and we are so thrilled to have you join this online event. And uh, we're grateful uh, that you set uh, time aside uh, to spend the afternoon with us. Um, so Newbie Education decide, decided to organize this event because uh, we wanted to create an avenue for parents, students, and boarding school representatives to interact with each other and discuss uh, the effects and changes and impacts that have resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have uh, representatives from uh, US and Switzerland boarding schools in this session. And uh, they are sitting on the panel discussion and they're really going to provide information on the measures and processes that they have put in place uh, in order to adapt to the changes caused by the pandemic and to ensure continuity of learning and uh, safety and well-being of students come uh, the forthcoming academic year in September. So this session will comprise of presentations by our panelists. Uh, each panelist is entitled to 10 minutes, uh, five minutes to introduce yourselves and your schools, and then the remainder uh, to talk about your uh, COVID-19 responses. Uh, following the presentations, we're going to have a Q&A session where our parents and students can, uh, you know, uh, ask whatever questions that they have or, you know, uh, concerns that they have that they would like to be addressed. So without further ado, I am now going to introduce our panelists. So uh, we've got Gillian Townsend from St. George's. Uh, International School in Switzerland. Hello, Gillian. Hi there. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Okay. And I believe this is your colleague. I'm so sorry I didn't get your name. George. Yeah, I'm the head of Oh, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you and thank you so much for joining the session. Uh, we've also got David Baker from St. Johnsbury Academy in the States. Hi there, how is Hello, everyone? Hello, David. <laughs> uh, we've got Jessed Agon, who's representing uh, Amerigo Education. Hi, Hi everyone. Jesse. Hello. <laughs> we've got uh, Chip Audette, who's representing Cardigan Mountain School in the US. Hello. Hi, Chip. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, Shea Adekobe, who's representing EF Academy, also in the States. Hi, Shea. Hello, everyone. And we've got Sarah Fry, who's representing Brilliant Mont International School in Switzerland. Hello, everybody. Bonjour. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much to our panelists. We are honored to have you on this session. And, you know, we're excited to gain insight uh, into the contingency measures that you have in place. Um, so I'm just going to announce some house rules. So like I previously mentioned, each panelist has 10 minutes to make their individual presentations. And uh, we've got a Q&A box here. Uh, so our parents can type in whatever questions that they have into the chat box. And once the presentations have concluded, I will read out the questions to the panelists to answer. Um, I'm now going to pass on to the newbie education executive. Oh, is it me? Oh, this thing is sad. Let's see me up. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Rose, can hear you. loud and clear. 
<laughs> I thought my network was uh, bad. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, Amari, for that uh, presentation. Um, Nubia Education is, I just want to give you a brief, very brief um, introduction about Nubia Education for some of you that don't know Nubi. Not in the panelists anyway, but for the parents who have connected from outside Lagos and Abuja, because Lagos and Abuja, Nubi is a household name, so it doesn't need much introduction. But some people have connected all over in, uh, in Nigeria. Uh, Nubi Education is based in Lagos, and we have a branch office in Port Harcourt. We have been in the business of placing students for over 16 years now. We are one of the leaders in the industry and a leader when it comes to boarding school placement. So we, um, we have been doing this business with some of our local schools. We, are, um, we have consulted for some of them. We do career counseling and then we, we um, also have the interests of our students. We are very passionate about them and that is why we got into um, um, partnership with a bank, a foremost bank in Nigeria, FCMB, who's, um, who has about 200 branches in Nigeria and 3.7 million customer base. So they are supporting us, they are sponsoring this event. Uh, Nubi is blessed with uh, seasoned staff, seasoned counselors, educationists, and market-driven uh, staff who is very familiar with the Nigerian education system and the, our student study destinations. We have gained the confidence of Nigerian parents, and that is why the success rate of Nubi is a, an immense contribution from our parents' word of mouth. So we, we have um, come to do this today because we normally have annual fairs. We had organized, we have um, arranged to have a fair in, in March, but that was canceled because of the pandemic. And this pandemic came with a lot of challenges, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of worries, and many parents are worried. They don't know where, you know, uh, what is going to happen to their words. They, they're asking questions that some of us couldn't answer. So we just thought that there would be, a, we, we have to have a forum like this with all the stakeholders so that they can ask their questions and you can answer their questions. And if possible, reassure them that your, your countries are safe for their children to come. I'll tell you one thing Nigerian parents are looking for because we are very protective of our our children. So one thing that Nigeria's parents are looking for is safety for their children. So it is uh, up to you now to prove to them, reassure them that your country is safe, a safe study destination. So Amari, I hand over to you to continue. Jesse, you are, you are our wallpaper. <laughs> Can you? I know he's back. Yeah, can you? Oh, uh... <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. I just got logged out. <laughs> I guess it's just. Yes, important. and then Jesse that took over from you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesse. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, so yes, uh, Jesse Dagon of Amerigo Education is our first panelist. So over to you, Jesse. Right. Um, I'm going to share a bit of a, it's a very quick presentation. I just want to have you guys um, see a little bit of what we are. So as Aunt Marie said, it's going to be a quick 10-minute presentation. i um, going to give you guys a quick overview of what Amerigo is. So we are, let me just take this down. So we're a group of high schools in the United States of America. We have 10 high schools in the U.S. You can see them on your screen. We have four schools in California, one school in Houston, Texas two schools in Chicago, one in Minneapolis, Minnesota, one in Lexington, Kentucky. 
and one in New Jersey. These are 10 high schools that are, um, they have A and A plus niche ranking. You can Google that on niche.com and you can see the rankings of all our schools. And we even have schools that have been recipient of the Blue Ribbon uh, School Award four times in a row. There's only 1%, only 1% of the high schools in the United States have been recipient of that um, amazing award uh, for four times, for four times, for consecutive times. And one of our schools has been awarded with that. Um, this is our model. We call ourselves a comprehensive boarding program. Um, we work and partner up with top high schools in the U.S. and we provide our international students academic support, mentorship, and cultural immersion. We know what an international student is and the challenges that you guys can face. So we, 90% of our schools are American, uh, with the population is American. So we only have a very small percent, which is 10%, but we know how to deal with this 10%. So we bring all this support together to make sure that everyone feels welcome, um, is well mentored, and has the best outcome possible. So this is our response to uh, the COVID-19 situation. We came up with something that is called a Start Anywhere. And the quick thing that I want to give you guys is I want to provide you um, some information on how um, how are we responding to the challenges? How can we challenge our, our students, um, even if they are back home, or they are going to be able to start with us? So um, I prepared for you guys um, a quick overview of what are we what we have. So what we're doing is is not a remote learning. What we have is online learning. You have to be that. Um, there's a difference in between remote, which is what the majority of schools were were forced to do at the at the end of or at the end of their school year at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, they're having to do Zoom classes, but that's not really that's not online. Online is a course that is being well designed to teach the students how to learn online and then how to absorb math, science, and all that kind of stuff. So we have learning success coaches. Um, all our students that can that are unable to join this September because of the pandemic and travel restrictions, they will have a university advantage um, coach that is going to help them to start their application uh, even from online. Um, there's going to be a seamless transition from whatever you do back in Nigeria online. It's going to be a seamless transition to our program in the U.S. Regular check-ins, about three to four check-ins a week. And what we want to do is, with this is we know how difficult it's been for parents to be teachers because parents are teachers. They're not parents. What we want to do is we want to remove that, um, that task from them. We want leave the teaching to us and you just have to be a parent. We will be looking after the daily um, academic curriculum of, of the kids. That's all our job. I prepare a quick video. Uh, there's going to be right after this. It's about a minute video that I want to show you guys. So even if it's online, our students are going to be able to pick, choose whatever they want to study. So from the from you know the the regular classes, math, science, uh, biology, chemistry, our students will have the opportunity to learn entrepreneurship, forensic science, phy uh, uh, psychology, biology, French, German, Spanish, um, art, guitar, whatever they want. And remember, these credits are going to be seamless. The transition is going to be seamless for when you start back in the U.S. Um, I prepared this really quick video for you guys. I'm going to... Um, Term, have the option to begin their American education online from their home country. We understand that online learning puts a lot of pressure on parents. To alleviate that, Amerigo Start Anywhere offers comprehensive support services. These services also ensure our students will still experience the many benefits of a U.S. education and the Amerigo program. Start Anywhere students will receive admission to their first choice Amerigo school. The complete online experience we provide will ensure that they feel like a student of the school. Our schools offer students an extensive list of courses. 
Honors and AP are available to eligible students. Our advisors will work with each student to create a personalized course list. This will ensure that the student's courses fulfill their graduation requirements. The courses consist of live and recorded lectures, projects, and weekly assignments. During live lectures, students interact directly with their teachers and can ask any questions they have. Amerigo will also provide students with academic tutoring, university guidance support, and English language learning. To ensure students stay on track with their studies, each student is assigned a learning success coach who will provide one-on-one -on -one support and monitor their academic progress. Start Anywhere still gives students the opportunity to experience American culture. Students will work on projects with their classmates in the U.S. Together, they will collaborate and complete assignments no different than when they eventually arrive to campus. They also have the option to join extracurriculars and partake in Amerigo's vibrant campus community. Amerigo will host virtual activities, including workshops and trivia nights. As soon as students can safely arrive to the U.S., their transition to campus will be completely seamless. Start Anywhere credits will immediately transfer to their high school transcript. From there, our Amerigo students will continue the rest of the school year safe, healthy, and academically prepared. So that is a quick video just to see uh, in real life what we're talking about. And And we have prepared as well, really quickly in the last minute that I have, I have prepared as well what we have called the honors track. And it's a way for students to start anywhere or even if they can travel and come out of our, um, our high school program with a $15,000 scholarship for university. So students that complete the honors track from our high school will receive a $15,000 scholarship for their tuition in university in the US. That concludes my 10 minutes, and I will hand it back to Anne-Marie. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, Jessid. Um, I mean, um, from the video and uh, from your presentation, it's evident that the Start Anywhere program, you know, is really geared towards providing students with, you know, uh, academic expertise, you know, the uh, same student experience and, you know, support uh, to set them up for success, um, similar to if they were enrolled on a face-to-face -face curriculum. Um, and uh, we'll go into detail about the 15K scholarship, because, <laughs> uh, you know, Nigerian families always love to hear about that. Um, uh, so I'm now going to pass on to the next panelist, uh, who is uh, Gillian Townsend from St. George's International School in Switzerland. Hi there, okay, I'm just going to um, share our screen here. So we've prepared nice. just a short presentation um, with, some, with some photos. Um, so just bear with me one moment. That's okay. Okay. Um, should go. Okay, so hopefully um, you can see there on the screen um, an aerial shot of our campus here in Switzerland. Yes. So this is a, a view of our campus and we are very lucky that we are located on the shores of Lake Geneva. So we have a fantastic location. We are very close to Geneva in fact, um, only one hour away, um, but we have a fantastically green campus. So we just want to spend the first five minutes giving you a short overview of our school. Maybe studying in Switzerland is, is something new um, for the Nigerian families to consider. Um, and then the last five minutes we'll talk a little bit about the Swiss response to COVID and how we are managing health and safety um, in the classroom. So we have some fantastic facilities at St George's and um, we have a very green campus. You can see that we have the football pitch there, tennis courts, we have basketball courts um, and, and lots of space green space for our students to enjoy. So as you mentioned, we're in Switzerland, Switzerland really being the heart of Europe. 
Um, we, there are several languages actually spoken in Switzerland, but we are in the French speaking area. Um, and as I mentioned, we're around one hour away from Geneva and two hours from Zurich. Um, so it should be quite easy for students to be able to, to get here um, and very close by to Lake Geneva. St. George's at a glance, we have a long history here at St. George's. We are a co-educational school. So we're actually a, um, a mixed day and boarding school with around approximately 400 students, around 80 of those students um, board with us and live here on, on campus. We are a school that has a Swiss ethos. We have a very traditional British rigor in our education, um, but we're also truly international in that we have over 60 different nationalities with us. Um, our boarding is available for students from age 10 to 18. And I think important for me to note here is that our studies are in English. Um, of course, our students do also learn French and really have the benefit of being immersed in French in a French speaking environment. But our students will be studying the majority of their subjects in English. And just briefly, our programs, I think many Nigerian families are probably familiar with a GCSE program. And that is something that we do offer here. Um, which is preparing our students in senior school to um, complete the IB diploma or a general diploma. And then our students head off to universities in the UK, they go to the US, Canada, some of them stay here in Switzerland and many other destinations around the world. So I'll hand over to Mr. Carver, who will give you a brief overview of boarding. Thank you. Yes, hello everybody. Um, so the boarding here at St George's is about 80 students, um, co-educational. Um, we are about, we have a, well, a lovely balance, about 50 50 boys and girls at the moment, um, spread over three floors um, in the boarding house, which is actually in the heart of the campus. So we're very lucky we don't have to walk um, through a village or town to get to our um, school facilities. It's all within the safety and security of the campus. Um, we have a mixture of single rooms, double rooms, triple rooms. Um, for students to share um, or if they choose to go in a single room. Um, we have, we're about to undergo some refurbishments as well, which is rather exciting. So the whole boarding specific areas are going to get um, um, revamped um, over the summer. Um, our boarding staff are purely pastoral. So our team of boarding staff do not teach. We are full-time focused on the um, pastoral education of the students. Um, so yeah, very, very dedicated and professional team. Um, we have a good program, as you can imagine, of, of weekend activities um, based as we are um, about half an hour, 40 minutes from some prime ski areas, um, the beautiful Swiss mountains, um, sailing on Lake Geneva um, and visits to cities, whether it's in Geneva or Lausanne, or further afield um, to, you know, hopefully in, in due course back to Milan is only three, four hours away. So um, we're very, very lucky in what we can uh, um, sort of offer in terms of an enrichment program um, here. Obviously, students living on site um, have access to all the um, facilities you would expect from a leading um, international boarding school. Um, so they can use those after school finishes, over the weekends, um, but also part of our um, sort of co-curricular enrichment um, activities, which run after school every day, which the day students and the boarding students take part in. Um, uh, these are activities offered by staff and professionals on the school site, but for those students who want to go to the next level, we've got... Um, excellent football clubs, uh, rowing facilities, um, horse riding, um, all within a, a very short distance from our front door. And um, we actually had a, a boarding student who was a weekly boarder, um, is in the Swiss uh, national rowing team um, and trains. You know, we made allowances for him to be able to train regularly. So there's that, there's that next step that we can go to, and we're very fortunate on that level. Um, the boarding, um, well, this is a, a, a interesting segue into it. The boarding um, school, um, St George's, is part of the Inspired Group, which is one of the biggest um, school groups in the world, um, and certainly the biggest group of boarding schools in Europe. We have about nine boarding schools um, within um, the uh, within Europe. 
um, which means we've got a huge amount of um, collaboration and sharing of ideas and um, sort of collaboration on, on academic but on a sporting level as well. So we have students who, who are very keen on golf, for example, who can go to our sister school in Soto Grande where they have a, um, a very high level golf program. And likewise, we're hoping to be able to, to bring students here to practice their skiing, for example, and take part in, in, uh, in all that we have here to offer. So that's very, very useful um, and reassuring um, on a financial level as well. The company is obviously secure and uh, um, you know, has, has good um, backup. Um, on to the health and safety um, in Switzerland and beyond. So I think the one key message that we really want to give to reassure parents is that not just our school, but all schools in Switzerland are very much open for learning. So I think Switzerland's response to, to COVID, um, you know, but once things got going here, that they uh, put in place measures very quickly. So we're very efficient in dealing with this situation. Um, our school closed, as did all other schools, uh, in March, and we moved to a full virtual online platform. But similarly, in reopening again, we have been equally efficient here in Switzerland in schools reopening. Um, and actually, a few days ago, there was a, um, an article by Forbes that listed Switzerland currently, I mean, things can change, but currently, as the world's safest country at the moment in terms of the COVID pandemic situation. So as a school, we are open for learning. Um, all schools in Switzerland, they have been given um, measures that we have to follow um, in terms of you know, health and hygiene. So disinfecting, um, this is something that's, that happens regularly in the common rooms and in the classrooms. Of course, as with everybody around the world, the regular hand washing, frequent cleaning, you know, the desks are, are regularly disinfected, as are the classrooms and the toilets. And on arrival at school, the students have their temperature taken um, each day. From, the, from a sort of boring residential side of things, um, for the younger students up to and including year 10, um, there is no requirement for them to be in, in any kind of social distancing from each other. So we're very fortunate that for our younger students, um, it's very much, I've got two daughters here at the school who fall under that category and they're delighted to be back in what they consider to be school as usual, playing with their friends, they're outside, they're playing, you know, taking part in all the clubs and activities after school, um, obviously respecting and social distancing with their teachers, um, but amongst themselves it's very much business as usual. Our older students came back um, this week and for them because they're treated as adults, um, and they have to social distance from themselves, and that, that just means a limiting on the number of students in um, within the classroom. Um, so allowances are being made for that. If students would like to wear a face mask, it's absolutely their own choice. Um, there's um, there's no requirement to, but they are encouraged to, and to maintain the social distancing, um, as as uh, Julian I think just mentioned. Um, the, so I think to, to wrap up um, the, the sort of COVID response within Switzerland, I, I really feel that we've been so lucky um, in how quickly the Swiss um, federal government and also local governments got onto the issue. Um, we're, we're blessed with a very, very, well, a world-renowned health system who feel um, very comfortable um, in their management of it going, not just at the moment, going forward. Um, to give you an idea, we went recently from a maximum of five people um, in, in any one group together to 30 people last week, um, I believe it was, and now we're able to actually have groups of 300 um, together. Um, they feel confident that, that they're able to manage any further outbreaks um, based on the, the, the response in, in March. Um, obviously everything can change, but as I say, they've been very quick to, to uh, get on top of everything. And I think importantly, just to note from our point of view, um, our boarding house is expected to be fully open in September. If the, for any reason it isn't, we do have contingency plans in place, but right now we're working towards being able to welcome all of our boarders in September as we normally would. 
And also right now, there is currently no quarantine imposed in Switzerland for, for people coming from overseas. So like we say, things can change and we have measures in place, you know, in case things do, but um, there is no quarantine. And for those students that can't currently be here, so our boarding students that are still in their home countries, we continue to offer a full virtual classroom so that learning can continue as normal for everybody. Um, and finally, we've just got a, a couple of uh, photos. We've got posters around the school um, outlining our, our daily school rules. Um, so for students to follow in the hand washing and, and so on as we would expect. And then just a few photos here. You can see the lines there on the road for, for students to remember the distance, um, taking temperature checks in the morning, um, and then plenty of hand sanitizing stations around the school as well. Yeah. But as a, as a boarding school that models itself um, or has done in the past very much on the, the, the British system, um, we are, well, and a lot of schools, um, boarding schools here are affiliated or members of the Boarding School Association of the UK, um, which works very closely with the Australian Boarding School Association. Um, and I think, uh, you know, they, they give very, very strict direction and very good information um, such as their COVID charter um, that was launched recently for schools to um, aim to be able to deliver to reassure parents that this you know the boarding environment school environment is safe um, so that coupled with Switzerland as a, as a renowned safe area is um, I think a very strong strong endorsement. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm sorry if we went over our 10 minutes. It's not very easy. <laughs> oh, no, it's perfectly fine. Thank you so much, Gillian and George, uh, for your presentation. So, I mean, um, for Nigerian parents listening in and, uh, you know, who are considering Switzerland as a study destination for their awards, uh, you know, I believe that, you know, what you said, you know, with regards to uh, the protocols uh, that your school has in place, uh, you know, concerning ensuring the safety of students um, in the classroom or uh, in the boarding houses, uh, and uh, the fact that at the moment, Switzerland is uh, the safest country <laughs> in the world in terms of the pandemic. And, you, you know, you have a medical system that is confident in its ability to manage uh, future outbreaks. And fingers crossed, there will be no future outbreaks. Um, I just feel, you know, <laughs> everything you've said will definitely reassure parents, you know, uh, who are considering Switzerland for their children this forthcoming academic year. I hope so. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so we're thank now you. going to move on, uh, thank you. We're gonna move on to Shea from EF Academy. Okay, thanks Anne-Marie. I'll just share my screen. Um, let's see. Share. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, I'm sorry, I just have to go back. So EF, um, it's a boarding school in the US and in the UK. Um, in the UK, we're in Oxford, and in the US, we're in New York, um, Thornwood, Upstate New York. Um, and we're opening a new campus next year in Pasadena, California. Um, so we offer um, the IGCSE IB, US High School Diploma in our New York campus. Um, and in our Oxford campus, um, we take students um, at age 16, and they come for either the IB um, diploma or the A-levels, and we prepare them for university. And this is the new campus in Pasadena um, that will be open next year, September. Um, with EF, EF in itself, Education First, has been around for over 55 years, um, and we cover different programs outside academy. So we have Holt University, we have EF Language Program, we have um, EF cultural exchange. So we do everything you could possibly think in the educational space. And this, um, especially in a time like this, has made us very aware of how diverse and how international we, ha we are and how we should prepare for um, our kids, our students when they come in September. Um, I'm just gonna skip this briefly um, and just um, this is how EF work. We work backwards. So we, um, from day one, ask our students, what do you want to study? 
um, where do you want to go? And we kind of make a tailored pathway program for each student, um, looking at like um, their subjects, the co-curricular, and also work experience. So that's something we support our students with even during this time. So we have some of our students during the summer break who have been matched up with um, different companies and they'll be doing like online uh, internships. So they have that at the moment and still getting support. Um, so this is just a deep um, dive into what they have. Um, and just the new experience. EF is a very international school um, with over 75 different nationalities and different home offices, admission offices in different countries. I sit in Nigeria and manage um, admission for West Africa. Um, so it's really about being in an international diverse environment. Um, and these are examples of where our students, university placements um, this year in the US alone. Um, and also in the UK. Um, so it's more of like, it's a inter very, very international um, school. So that's why we need to understand, you know, through, especially now in COVID, we have to think not just the US alone, but you know, how are we going to stop? How are we going to receive students from all over the world? Um, I want to show you what we're doing in terms of COVID. Just give me a second. So we've come up with something called the EF Promise. Um, I'm going to play this video now, um, and this is something we've shared with all our parents and our teachers um, and students, um, and I'll explain after the video what the EF Promise is all about. Sorry about that. Um, so what the EF Safe Learning Promise is about is basically um, we understand that the educational things have changed um, and the educational system is not going to stop in September and school goes on. Um, but we have different parents that we've been speaking to and students and they have, we have gotten um, received different kind of feedback. There are some parents that are comfortable sending their kids off in September. And there are some that are not, and that's the reality of what we're facing now. And so at EF, we have two options. School, no matter what starts in September. However, parents have now flexibility of sending their kids when they feel comfortable. So we know, for example, students from Nigeria especially are going to be having, um, especially the students that need visa, would struggle with um, visa application and when the embassy opens. Um, so we have now made provision for them. So come September, if you have, if you're on this um, other um, school of thought that you need visa, you need to apply, we have the option for you to start online. So we started the online EF um, virtual learning third term and we've gotten feedback from our parents and we've been able to revise um, what we started with. And because you're going to start online, we have that option of, so it's everything that's going to be happening. It's just going to have um, log in online um, and get on with the material and get on and we're offering support. However, we understand that it's not going to be easy for every child as we have, like I said, 75 different nationalities. 
and different time zones. So you're going to be logging in. We're going to be, we're going to be taking into consideration the different time zones. Um, you're going to be logging in and having a long period, window period to submit assignments. Um, in terms of um, in terms of health and safety, um, we already have at EF, we have staff and um, full-time staff nurses on campus um, taking care of our students, but we're also saying before you leave your home country, um, EF is requiring um, a health certificate. So you're required to do a COVID test, COVID-19 test, seven days before departure. And when you get on campus, every child is going to be retested. Um, just because we want parents to be very comfortable with their kids on campus. Um, we have also, um, we also understand that they, um, you know, sharing of accommodations would not work as we used to have. So we're also practicing social distancing. We're giving students more space in the room. So we're more encouraging more on suites, um, apart from wearing of masks within campus and the temperature checks. And um, we're also, um, during this period, because we're going to have options of people starting online and then transferring. So we understand that, you know, from a financial perspective, it would be unfair to re um, ask the parents to pay the same amount. So parents who are not able to start in September um, and start online to when they're ready, will be getting up to 25% of their tuition refunded to them. Um, as well as accommodation fee. Um, so it's now up to the parents to decide, you know, when do I feel comfortable sending my child off? And it's just based on, you know, giving that parents their reassurance that whenever you're ready, we're ready to receive your child. But in the meantime, we're going to be supporting them. So pretty much that's what we have at EF during COVID-19. Um, and that's how we're supporting our students come September. Thank you. Thank you very much for your in-depth presentation, Cher. So uh, the um, contingency measures that your school has in place are very rigorous. I know um, uh, an area that uh, our parents, uh, well, uh, the genesis of a lot of our questions from parents uh, has centered on, um, like you attested, uh, the pandemic has addressed change the way in which learning is delivered with you know uh, schools closing early around the world face-to-face -face classes being suspended you know and uh, teaching moving online um, I know uh, parents are sort of concerned about uh, you know how their kids will adapt to virtual learning. You know, in Nigeria, we still have the travel restrictions in place. We do not know when uh, international flights will resume. Um, you know, so until these restrictions are lifted, uh, you know, yes, uh, parents want to know what support is going to be made available to their children. Um, so we'll talk more in detail during the Q&A session about how your existing students you know, have reacted to virtual learning? Are they engaged? Are they motivated? Are they connecting with their peers and their teachers? And what is their current mindset? Um, okay, so we're now going to move on to the next panelist, who is Sarah from Brilliant Mont International School in Switzerland. So, hello, everybody. Um, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can see yes. you. <laughs> okay, and can you see the picture of the school? Yes, we can. Yes. It's very okay. beautiful. <laughs> okay. Um, so so um, my, my uh, colleagues from St. George's, hello, <laughs> um, who are just down the road, have talked a lot about, um, about Switzerland and the measures that we have taken. And in Switzerland, certainly, um, we are... Um, we are managing the COVID situation in a very positive manner. There has been this study that came out, um, which put Switzerland at the top, the Forbes study, um, uh, the top in terms of how countries had managed the situation. So that's very positive and very encouraging. Um, the Swiss people have um, responded very well to the measures taken by the, uh, by the government. And I think um, I think the key message, actually, in all this in all this, is that 
every context is different. So this is the Swiss context, but this is the context today, and maybe in two months, it'll be different. Um, and I think, you know, every school we've had to adapt very quickly um, to protect the safety of our students, of our staff as well. And we will continue to do so and continue to adhere to the measures imposed by the local authorities so that we adhere and to the restrictions um, and the guidelines that they give the schools. Um, our school uh, actually is maybe a bit different to some of the others in the sense that we still have boarding students here. Um, we initially, when the pandemic came out, we were talking about students who might not be able to travel home um, at Easter to their families. And so we envisage staying open over Easter to provide support for those students. And then the situation developed very quickly. And in fact, um, the students coming from countries where we thought it was too dangerous for them to travel, uh, it was actually a situation where Switzerland is being confronted with the, with the pandemic and serious numbers. So the students who wanted to, to leave um, obviously, we felt it was better to encourage them to go home to their families, but there were students who were unable to leave. And, um, for example, a boy from Iran who would have had to go back to do military service in his country. And so these students have stayed at the school. And in fact, um, we still have two students. We have our, our graduation on Friday with a virtual graduation, but we have two students who are still here who have been wanting to get back, um, but have been unable to do so. And we've always uh, said to them, you know, this is your home. And as long as you can't get back, then you are absolutely, of course, welcome to stay here. And we have boarding staff who are still here looking after them. Um, so it's quite an odd situation. And the school with just uh, a couple of students is very different to our school, which normally has around 80 boarding students. So we are a very small boarding school. We're in Lausanne in the um, French speaking part of Switzerland. So about 20 minutes away from St. George's, which is just down the road. Um, so we're in the heart of the city and a lot of our students who are coming um, like to be in the city. But for those students um, from the beginning of March, from the 5th of March, we did not allow our boarding students to go into the city. So they were kind of on lockdown on campus before the authorities made us go into lockdown. Um, so we took those precautions to protect the community and our boarding staff have not been on cam off campus since then. Um, so I think, you know, everybody will be quite relieved when the students can finally get home to their parents. Um, and we can start to live a, a bit more of a normal life around here. Um, so we are uh, in the centre of Lausanne, as I say. We were founded in 1882 uh, by my husband's great-grandparents. So we're a family-owned, family-run school. Um, it's always been in the family. We, we're very proud uh, that the school has, uh, has this family uh, feel has this family ownership it's very important to our identity and particularly because we are a small school so that's also the family uh, the family values are what made us say to our students you can stay here you know we're, we're not just here for the good times with you we're here to help and support you through the bad times so that's what we did over the past few weeks um, so unfortunately, our students normally would enjoy all the opportunities that, that being in Switzerland uh, can give to them, uh, which means going out to, to do sports activities in the city, going to the, going to the theatre, cultural events, uh, going skiing, uh, going further afield on trips to Zurich or to Milan or to Paris, because we're very close by to all these places. Um, they haven't obviously been doing that for the past weeks, um, but we are hoping and we're fairly confident that in September for the start of the new school year that if the situation continues like this we will be able to open um, as normal and provide these opportunities for the students because being able to discover the local area and further afield is a, an important part of the program. Um, so we take students from eighth grade up to twelfth 
and we have a post high school 13th grade. We teach um, international programs, so we teach Cambridge IGCSE and then moving on to either an American high school diploma with SAT or a British um, A-level programme, so uh, Cambridge International A-levels. The teaching is in English, but our students can also uh, take French. They have to take French. It's uh, part of the local culture, so that's very important for us. And very, we're a very small school, as I, as I keep saying, so very small classes, an average class size of nine, with lots of teach contact. We have a few day students as well who come um, around 10, 15 day students who come, but primarily we are boarding, that's our main focus. Um, so after Briamont, our students, uh, they take, uh, well, they're taking the AS or the A-level or the American high school program, or they can actually take a combination of the two. So they might be destined to go to the States but might want that academic challenge that A-levels can bring. And so we can very much personalize the education to the students. Um, and this is a slide showing the different destinations that they go to. So the majority going after is to university in the UK, but some going in, staying in Switzerland if they've got the right level of French, um, particularly the hospitality, the Ecole Hotelier of Lausanne is, is an important destination for us or Geneva or Lausanne University. Um, but also going to the States. So uh, boarding school life is obviously a lot about the extracurricular. Um, and as I said, that has been um, restrained over the past uh, few months. Um, we know, for example, that after school activities like Model United Nations, where we normally take the students on a trip to Singapore, has been canceled for next year. So certainly uh, with schools, maybe like St. George's or other international schools locally, we'll try to put together opportunities for students to meet um, and to have uh, debates and conferences, which they would normally do further afield in an overseas context. Um, so many different opportunities here and our students enjoy the lake, the mountains, uh, developing service learning skills as well. Again, that is something that they've not been able to get involved in. Um, but hopefully now, as things get back to normal, the students will be able to take a veil of all these opportunities. Now, here we see some students actually wearing masks already. This is at the Colour Run, which is a, a race um, in Lausanne. Um, so our students come from all over the world, and, and I was asked to talk about coming back to school. And um, I think the key message, as I said, is that we have to, each school has to respond to the protocols and the directives put in place by their local authorities. So um, at the moment, yes, uh, you know, social distancing is, is, is obviously very important, um, maintaining the respect within the classroom for those social distancing. Our students are, uh, because we just have two borders at the moment, they are learning on distance learning um, along with all the other students scattered all over the world. We made individual programs for those students because they're in different time zones. Um, so we really personalized our learning to those students. With regard to the return of students in September, um, we want every student to take a COVID test no, no longer than 48 hours prior to their return to the school. Um, we are defining our uh, arrivals process for families coming, coming back to bring their child. So um, normally we have a welcome reception when the families bring their, their child with all the parents together. That might not be possible in the current situation. So we are going to give uh, arrival slots to families when they can come to the school. So they must arrive at a certain time with their child only one parent will be able to bring their child um, to the school because quite often we have younger brothers and sisters, cousins, sometimes grandparents who want to come. And we obviously need to limit um, that. So we will have to ask that only one parent accompanies their child. We will be testing students um, who display symptoms. So they have to arrive with evidence of having taken the COVID test no longer than 48 hours prior to arrival. 
and then they, uh, if they display symptoms, we have in place a quarantine procedure and an isolation procedure um, within our school. We have lots of different buildings, so we have one building which we dedicate to the isolation of students with uh, measures obviously to look after those people in isolation so that our staff are protected and so that the students are cared for um, as long as they need be until they recover. We have, like every school, we have a school doctor, um, we have a school nurse also who's on campus physically every day and in Lausanne we have the county hospital just five minutes away. Um, but I think we in Switzerland we are very reassured by the fact that the children have been back in school now for five weeks and that the numbers uh, of cases has continued to decline. So this is very reassuring that actually um, the presence of children together is not going to aggravate the, the risk of transmitting COVID. Um, I think we, we're also talking about the shared responsibility because before prior to arrival in the school, um, you know, the parents, we expect them to share responsibility in making sure their child is safe, in making sure that they respect the protocols, that they, they, they hand washing, hygiene, mask wearing, so that that responsibility is shared between the families prior to coming to the school and on arrival as well, so that the community is very protected. Um, in, within the classroom, uh, we're looking at the classroom disposition, not having too many things in the classroom. Lots of teachers have lots of decorations, lots of things to, to animate their class and their lessons. Um, so, uh, so removing those, uh, those objects which might be a, a risk to health is also very important. Um, uh, what was I going to say to you again? Um, yeah, so, I, so the measures, uh, again, every school is, is free to adapt the measures uh, within the guidelines. Some schools might prefer to, to test students on arrival. Um, as I said, we don't feel it's necessary unless they're displaying symptoms as long as they've done the test, um, the test beforehand. So just let me go back to the Zoom because I'm losing you there. Um, Oh, we can see you, Sarah. Can you see me now? Okay, yeah. right. Um, so uh, I think that's all actually for the moment. With regard to the uh, students who arrive late, so if a student has to arrive late because of a health reason or because of a flight restriction, then we will be including that student in the, in the, 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 the distance learning, making sure that they feel very much part of the community until the time that they can physically get to the school. Um, so the flights in Switzerland open on the 15th of June, the Schengen borders are opening on the 15th of June. We know that flights from um, Asia are starting to happen in July. We have also uh, been working with Swiss boarding schools to uh, look at the visa situation because the consulates and the embassies were closed um, around the world and were not dealing with visas. And typically a Swiss visa might take three to four months, so it's quite a long time. Um, but we got together with a lawyer to lobby the government and the visas for students uh, wanting to come to start education in Switzerland in September have been fast-tracked. And the offices, the consulates are open from this week and starting again to deal with visas. So that's very reassuring for the families that, that there should not be a delay in their child coming to Switzerland to start the programme. However, if there is a delay, then our school, like I'm sure other schools, will be adapting the, the, the teaching um, to, you know, to take into, the, into account until the time that the student can safely arrive in Switzerland. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has been covered actually by people already because we're all on the same page pretty much. So I don't want to sort of repeat things. Um, so I think that's all. And I think I've taken my 10 minutes <laughs> easily. <laughs> Thank you so much, thank you. Sarah. Um, so, um, I mean, um, thank you for providing an update on uh, visa applications. You know, uh, so that's something that, uh, yes, families wanted clarification on, whether uh, visa centers were reopening, you know, what the timeline was going to be like, how quickly will visas be processed, etc. Um, 
uh, another thing that you uh, mentioned was that you're a family, a small family owned school, and you know, you provide that community feel for your students where each student feels valued. Uh, you know, we do have some parents who have that requirement. Uh, mm-hmm. They know, I mean, parents know, you know, what kind of children they have. So they know uh, what environment they feel their, their child will yeah. thrive in. And, you know, they seek that for their child, you know, a school that has small class uh, sizes, you know, in order to enhance student teacher relationships, yeah. uh, you know, to make sure that students are directly involved and in participating in classes and they're receiving, you know, that necessary one-to-one attention and encouragement and support, yes. uh, you know, so thank you so much for that information. We're now going to move on to uh, uh, David from St. Johnsbury Academy in the U.S. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here and talk to you about St. Johnsbury Academy and uh, a little bit about us overall and then a little bit about our, our response that we, uh, that we have been forced into taking to this, to this worldwide pandemic. So I'm going to share my screen here with you to tell you a little bit about um, our school first. And then I'm going to jump over and actually touch a little bit on some student mental health uh, conversations as well so that we can talk about what we're doing for our students' mental health uh, upon their return to to boarding school. So just to give you a little sense of of who we are, we're an independent uh, co-ed school, boarding and day school in the Northeast part of the United States in in a state called Vermont. Uh, And we have grades nine through 12 in the US US education system. We also have a small postgraduate program as well. So students, older than grade 12 as well come and and, uh, do a year of sort of what we call our super senior year where they're trying to figure out what's what's next for them to give you a geographical sense of where we are in the in the country we're right uh, where that orange dot is in the in the northeast corner of vermont Um, i'm going to talk about it more in a little while but vermont's response to covid uh, has been one of the best in the country Um, we only have out of the now sadly over two million cases in our country Vermont only has uh, just over a thousand cases total. Uh, And our county where we are and as as where St. Johnsbury is, so St. Johnsbury and the surrounding towns have only had 16 cases total for the entirety of this uh, pandemic. So we we're in a very, very safe place geographically. Uh, We don't have a large population density and that's probably part of it, but also our state and local governments have done a really good job of, uh, of responding and keeping things closed and, and slowly, as we've been calling it, we've been turning the spigot slowly to reopen our, our state. Um, just a little bit about our mission statement. We really focus on uh, our character of our students and building s- students of good character, uh, creating inquisitive learners who are not afraid to ask questions and really get into the nitty gritty of, of their education and wanting them to be uh, you know, focused on inquiry and also the probably the biggest part of our mission is creating a community that's one that our students want to be a part of uh, and they feel welcome. And we, I always say that it, it appears to me, and I'm a, I'm a graduate of the school, so I, I, I went here. Um, from, the di- from the day I stepped on campus, I felt like this was my second home and my second family. Uh, and every student that I see come through our boarding, especially our boarding program, um, seems to feel the same way. Um, so you can just get a sense of our vast campus here, and I won't, I won't touch on what every one of those buildings are, but that's a beautiful shot of, of the New England foliage there. That's a, a photo that was taken in October. Um, this gives you a sense of our, again, our campus map. We're, we're a pretty um, vast campus. Uh, we're right in the middle of our town. So our town only has about 8,000 people in it, uh, and our school plays a big part in the local community as well. Um, so our students are very familiar with our town and the town and the people in our town are very familiar with our students. So it's a very uh, warm and welcoming relationship between the town and the school. It's, they're not separate. They're very much one and the same. To give you a little sense of our academic opportunities, I'll sort of fly through these. Um, we have over 200 courses. 30 of those are advanced placements. Uh, we were one of the first four countries in the United, excuse me, the first four schools in the United States to offer the AP capstone diploma. That's the advanced placement um, diploma, which is sort of the, the advanced placement uh, answer to the IB curriculum. So it's, it's similar in, in structure and similar in how um, rigorous it is academically, but it's a totally different program from the IB. So students uh, at our school can take the AP diploma track. 
Um, and then we also have fine and performing arts and you'll see some of our fine and performing arts center. Um, we have world-class technical engineering and computer science programs as well. Our technical education program is one that's very unique to boarding schools in the United States. We have a full uh, culinary arts program where students um, actually run a restaurant if they're part of that program that we have uh, right off of our campus. We have culinary arts kitchens. We have automotive mechanic shops right on campus. We have a full woodworking studio on campus. Um, so it's sort of that's sort of a unique uh, niche that we have. We have all the technical courses you could offer while also offering 30 APs and all the high level courses as well. Um, we also offer ESL and we have very, um, we have four foreign languages that we teach and we also have different levels of learning support as well. Um, we follow a university style schedule. So this sort of shows you what our, what our schedule looks like. These are just example schedules, but we follow a five block schedule. Um, and uh, usually one of those blocks in each semester is a free block or a study block. And then you fill the rest um, with uh, the, the, the blocks sort of as you see fit. These are some of our signature programs. If I had more time, I would go into all of them because they're amazing. Uh, but I already talked about the AP Capstone uh, program. We have a biomedical and health services certificate for those who are interested in going into the medical field. So if you're looking to study pre-med and then go to medical school, you can start working on the, those types of things uh, at our school. We have a vast fashion design program with an amazing fashion design studio. Um, we have post-calculus mathematics, so university level math, pre-university engineering and robotics. Uh, we have had in the past a robust tra uh, international travel and cultural exchange program. That remains to be seen what that'll look like this year. Um, this is more about our engineering center and our brand new virtual reality lab that we just added. So we're really trying to be at the forefront of sort of the STEM field and uh, staying up to date, if not at the forefront of technology and education. It's something that we felt very lucky about uh, our ability to, to provide for our students. It's an amazing program and all state of the art materials. Um, we're a very traditional American, American school in the sense that we have 48 interscholastic athletic teams. So these are varsity sports. Uh, the, our students are not competing in a prep school league. They're competing in um, what's called the Vermont Principals Association Division I. So we're the highest division of, of competition in the state of Vermont. And our sports are broken up into three seasons. So the fall, you'll see that we have the, the cheerleading cross country in that list, and then the winter sports season, um, and then the spring sports season. So students can play a sport in each one of these seasons, and they're encouraged to do so. Um, we've already had the governor of Vermont um, give the okay to reopen some sports training. Um, and I'll go more into that too when we talk about our response. This is just some of our clubs and activities that are offered for our boarding students. So Obviously, students, especially this year, are going to be kept very busy. They're probably going to have some limited opportunities to get off campus. So we're going to have plenty of opportunities for them on campus. Uh, and these and probably many more activities will pop up as well. Um, some more sport uh, activity opportunities here for our students. Intramural are a little bit less competitive and uh, less of a time commitment for our students. But if they just want to play with their friends, they can do that there. This is more about our art studio and, and really our, our art center is one of our real um, signature programs. I mean, we have a, a, a space there, as you can see, the building itself is gorgeous. Um, it's really a, a university level fine arts facility. So if any student is very interested in arts, whether it's digital art, performing arts, or, or, um, or fine arts, we have, I would love to talk more because we have a, a really fantastic program and I can go into a lot more detail. Just some more photos of our, um, of our facilities here. Some of our athletic facilities are shown here. We have a, an indoor pool, weight room, um, five athletic fields for our athletic programs. Um, as you can see the aerial view there, the one all the way on the far left is our American football field and then our soccer pitch and then our field hockey field to the right. Some photos of our boys dormitories, our girls dormitories, looking at things that we do throughout the region on the weekends and things like that. Um, and then just some fast facts about our, about our school. So um, as you can see there, the top fast facts were founded in 1842. So we've been around for over 175 years uh, and we've been a boarding school for about 130 of those. So uh, we're represented by 30 countries uh, and uh, we have about 250 boarding students in our school with a total population of about a uh, thousand students total. So we have a, a larger day student population, um, but our students are in classrooms of about 10 or 12 to one. So we still keep everything very small within our classrooms. Um, and that's sort of the overview of our school. 
Um, and I'll, I'll, I put together a little slide about slideshow about our um, response as students go as far as student mental health um, and really keeping a focus on that. And I know I don't have that much um, longer as far as time goes. I'm trying to keep my time here, but I'm going to show you sort of what we're talking about as far as how we're responding with student mental health. Um, so one of the things that we've talked about uh, within our school is that there's just a general uptick in adolescent anxiety and depression and mental health challenges over the years. Um, luckily, students have technology to keep them connected to their friends, uh, and that has allowed them to sort of fill a social void during this whole COVID-19 uh, outbreak. It's been tough for some students, but from our, from our health experts on campus, um, really it's students that probably have already struggled with mental health that are struggling the most uh, with this, with this um, change. So the, the main things for us were providing mental health resources for our students. Um, really, we've utilized full, three full-time counselors on staff and students can drop into those as needed or they can schedule um, counseling sessions with those students. This is something that most U.S. boarding schools have, uh, uh, mental health resources for students. There's no negative stigma. We really like to make sure our students know we want them to have the best possible mental health and, and mental wellness that they can. Um, and so we, we encourage them to utilize these resources while they're on campus. The biggest change and probably the biggest uh, thing that we're thinking we're going to have to manage are the expectations of what students think boarding school is going to be like, because obviously they're going to be coming into a totally new world uh, and something that we is new to us as well. So, um, you know, boarding school typically is all about physical and emotional closeness with people and getting people connected on a very sort of intimate basis because that we want those relationships to be built. However, this year, we're probably going to have to focus on doing that in much smaller groups. So our dorms are going to stay, uh, our dormitory groups are going to stay closer together. Um, within our bigger dorms, we may have smaller families or pods that people are part of, and they spend most of their time with those students and those uh, faculty members. Um, also, obviously, encouraging proper physical health to help mental health. We have lots of um, sports that have already started uh, and lots of physical, uh, outdoor physical opportunities for students to exercise programs, biking, hiking, swimming. Vermont is a very um, outdoor recreational friendly state, so we have a lot of opportunities for our students. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the contingency plan. So just so everyone's aware, our governor of the governor of the state of Vermont um, just two days ago um, came out and, and said that schools will open in the fall. So we are planning fully 100% that we're going to be open in the fall. Um, like a couple other people have said, things tend to change by the day. And that's why we don't, we won't want to make any big promises right now as far as um, what the contingencies are going to look like, because we have to, uh, we have to adapt as the governor is giving us directives. Um, as of right now, what we know is that people are planning to be on campus. All of our boarders are planning to be on campus. Um, and we may have to call those students, um, who are coming to board with us back to school early for uh, even not even calling it a quarantine, but more of an isolation and observation for maybe a week or two before they uh, before the school year starts. And during that time, we'll have lots of outdoor uh, activities for students, but also some academic enrichment too. So some ESL classes, ACT, SAT preps, uh, prep classes and things like that. So if students have to come back early um, in order to prep and make sure that they're healthy, uh, we're not going to make them just sit in an isolated room. We're going to have opportunities for them to do things as well. Something that I think is really important for the parents who are listening here, and I know my time is up, um, I think it's important during this whole process, no matter what school you talk to, asking the questions during the admissions process. What, what services are offered at your school? What are your contingencies? How are your dorm proctors trained during this difficult time? Um, how will my child be oriented to your school and how is that different from years past? I think it's also very important for you to discuss your child and any concerns you have in detail with your school's health services director. Try to get connected with them, um, have conversations with those people. Uh, schools are very open and they want, to, they want to give you the information, but oftentimes it's all about um, sharing that information and, and connecting with the right people on campus and asking questions. Um, so just to review, um, I think that's the end. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing my screen, but just to review, so we are fully planning on, on being open in the fall. Um, our response to this has been, the state's response has been really fantastic. Um, we actually are planning on, if this, if this uh, event was three days from now, I would have the full plan laid out for you. But because we just found out from the governor yesterday, our administrative teams are working today and through the weekend, and we're going to push out some information on Monday. So I will share that with Anne-Marie uh, and Rose, and we can feel free to push out our, our official plan to parents um, when we have it. But as of right now, we're looking forward to welcoming people back to campus uh, this fall. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much for your presentation, David. Um, you know, so just jumping on uh, uh, the point that you made with regards to mental health support uh, that is available at your school. Uh, you know, there's scientific evidence that uh, good mental health is critical to a student's success at school. And, you know, pupils who receive the necessary emotional, uh, social uh, uh, support, you know, uh, uh, you know, do better academically. Uh, so thank you for going into depth about the mental health resources and services that you have available for students at St. John's Free Academy. We're now going to move on to the last panelist, who is Chip Audette uh, from Cardigan Mountain School in the US. Hi, Chip. OK, so he started sharing his screen. So we can see your screen chip, but yeah. I can't hear you. Okay, good. Yeah. I can hear you. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, that's fine. <laughs> You can see the screen now. Uh, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm not going to go through all the slides, um, but um, just a few. Uh, where it, uh, this is, uh, I'm the director of admissions at Cardigan Mountain School, which is a, a junior boarding school, uh, all boys um, in uh, Canaan, New Hampshire, which is just a bit south from St. Johnsbury, uh, Vermont. Um, so you, you, there's a, a picture that was probably taken in October as well. You can see the fall foliage. Um, as a junior boarding school, we are um, working, and, and again, we're, we're um, all boys, um, and uh, we will be celebrating our 75th anniversary. We were going to celebrate it this, uh, this fall. Uh, we'll be celebrating it uh, probably next fall, a little bit of a delay, but um, we're a junior boarding school, uh, all boys, junior boarding meaning uh, we accept, uh, uh, we enroll boys in grades um, uh, six through nine, um, roughly 11 years old to uh, 15 years old. We typically have uh, 200, 205 boarders and maybe 20 day students or so uh, from 25 to 30 states and usually 15 to 20 countries. Uh, so we're primarily um, a, a boarding school, uh, and a boarding school for uh, middle school boys. So um, uh, you, you, I'm sure you can understand that social distancing will be a challenge with that age group. Um, but I think we, we've, we've got a pretty good place, uh, plan in place um, for that. Um, again, yeah. The, we do also have a co-ed summer program. Um, we don't this summer, obviously, um, but that's uh, for boys and girls in, in uh, ages eight to 15. It's a wonderful program. We, it is a good feeder uh, program for us, uh, for some of the boys in the program coming to the academic year, but obviously that uh, didn't happen this year. Um, in, in terms of the curriculum, we're, it's a, we, we term it a pre-college prep curriculum. Um, it's a strong emphasis on uh, the, uh, the core disciplines, uh, English, math, science, history, and foreign language. Um, we have a very comprehensive uh, secondary school placement program and counseling program. All of our boys are going on to primarily boarding schools, uh, both in the U.S., um, uh, particularly in the northeastern part of the U.S., uh, but also abroad. Um, uh, listening to the two schools from um, uh, Switzerland, I would certainly um, encourage some of our boys to look there. Looks pretty nice to me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, be, we're, we're, because we're working just with middle school boys um, uh, it, it, in, in a relatively small school, but a, 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 a uh, relatively large faculty, we have 65, probably closer to 70 full-time faculty members almost all of whom live on campus uh, in the dormitories with the boys. Uh, so it certainly takes a, a special kind of person to, um, uh, to want to, uh, this way of life uh, because structure and, and, and supervision is so important with this age, with this age boy. Um, 
some of the signature programs, because again, we're working just with, with middle school boys, um, we know that uh, executive functioning skills and, and understanding their learning style is so important. Uh, so uh, we have a program called PEAKS, which is Personalized Education for the Acquisition of Knowledge and Skills. It's both a course, uh, but a department through which um, the boys can get uh, uh, individual help. And this, um, uh, uh, there are five PEAKS department members, and this, uh, they were instrumental in the success of our, of our distance learning program. Um, as they were able to pop into different course, uh, different classes, make sure boys who were sort of on their radar were doing well, um, uh, because structure, uh, it, because we're so structured, uh, that becomes sometimes difficult, uh, uh, certainly with this age group in a distance learning uh, format. Uh, but we learned some, some, some good things about how, much, how we might tweak the PEAKS program when we're back on campus. The other program that is uh, the Gates Invention and Innovation Program, and it's really part of our, our um, science and, and STEM STEAM program, we're one of two middle schools in the country that have it. Um, it's uh, all based on problem solving, hands-on learning. Boys are um, either individually or in uh, pairs asked to come up with a, um, an idea for a product that will help solve some prog uh, problem. Um, uh, they uh, design that in the um, Epic Center, which is the design lab, and then build a prototype in our, um, our, our gate shop, which will actually have a new home uh, this, um, uh, this fall. Uh, like St. Johnsbury and all the boarding schools in the U.S., we, um, uh, athletics is a very important part of every uh, uh, boys program. We have uh, 39 teams and 17 sports. And there's, the important thing is there's a level for every boy that wants to play any sport. Um, uh, the varsity level, they tend to be very skilled and experienced. Uh, it goes all the way down to the reserve uh, program, which is for beginners in a sport. But um, physical activity, because it's a very holistic approach, whole boy approach, obviously daily physical activity is very important um, uh, also to their mental health. And we have a full clubs program on Thursdays. Like a lot of schools, we take a little break from sports and, and there's uh, 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 almost any club a, a boy wants to participate in or start is, uh, is possible. Um, again, we're almost all boarding. So um, we have uh, 16 dorms that range in size from six to 16 students. All students live in a double. Um, there are no triples, uh, and there may be a few singles. Uh, obviously, if we have an odd number of kids, somebody's living in a sig uh, single. And for our international students, the new students always will share, a, um, uh, will always have a, 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 a U.S. roommate. That's part of the experience that they want, uh, and that's, uh, so we, we, we uh, provide that for them. We put a lot of emphasis on leadership and character development. Um, uh, these boys at this age are, are very impressionable. Uh, they're, um, uh, they're trying to figure a lot of things out. Their social emotional growth is very important, but we also want them to uh, develop the leadership skills so that, uh, and, and understand that leadership takes uh, a lot of different forms, uh, but when they leave uh, Cardigan, uh, uh, they, they go on to, can go on to, uh, uh, secondary schools where they will continue uh, to uh, um, take on leadership roles. It, it, the uh, advisory pro program, and again, the, with this age boy, we want a lot of contact with different adults, but the advisor is, 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 is very important, uh, uh, not only to the, to, the, um, to, the, uh, to the boy, but it's also the, the point person for the um, for the parents. Uh, the advise, they meet with their advisors four or five times a week um, uh, just to check in. Um, and again, that's the, the, uh, the, the, the advisor is there to make sure each boy is, is uh, initially adjusting to the school okay, um, and that every aspect of his life is, is going okay. Um, they, they monitor the classroom, the academics, the athletics, uh, uh, dorm life, everything uh, for that boy. Uh, and, and again, 
um, can uh, be in constant contact with or often in contact with the, um, with the parents. Uh, weekend activities will probably look a little bit different this year. Um, typically, we have a lot of off-campus trips that are uh, chaperoned by faculty members divided into teams. Um, we're sorting through that now. Uh, we, we really don't know what that'll look like. Um, so we're, we suspect that the on-campus activities in the student center and the, the, um, the various athletic facilities, the art uh, facility will, will, will play a larger role in that. Uh, uh, the, the class of 2020 matriculation, as I said, the, um, uh, the secondary school placement is an important part, particularly um, uh, for parents. Uh, and I'm not, it's usually about 35 to 40 different schools that our kids go on to. Um, for the secondary schools out there, you, 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 um, uh, I would note that we usually have about 80 um, uh, uh, a captive audience of about 80, 80 students who are all going to go somewhere um, the, the following year. So um, you're certainly welcome to, uh, uh, to reach out to our secondary school uh, counselors to um, uh, talk about your programs as well. I'm not going to get into the summer session um, since it's not happening. Uh, just a couple of things. I mentioned the Gates program. This building is currently under construction. It'll be ready for the fall. Uh, it's about 19 or 20,000 square feet. It will house the Gates Invention and Innovation Program, the Design Center, art classrooms, um, and as I said, it will be ready. Um, it'll allow, and there's a, I guess, a, a picture of it. Uh, it will, um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Uh, um, it, that, that building will allow us to free up some other space uh, for additional science classrooms, um, as well as uh, um, uh, in, in a, a new music center. Uh, again, all scheduled to be open in the fall. Uh, speaking of the fall, uh, we have put a stake in the ground and said we're going to uh, be uh, open um, in, uh, as scheduled in September with students on campus, probably earlier than September. Uh, we suspect that all of our domestic boarders will be able to uh, get here. We feel that a lot of the, inter the returning international students will be able to arrive. Um, the question uh, in large part is for us is new international students, whether they'll be able to um, get visas and navigate uh, the travel bans that may still be in place. Uh, but in, in terms of um, uh, uh, having students on campus, again, we're in New Hampshire and Lake Vermont, we're, we're uh, at St. Jo St. Johnsbury, we're, we're pretty rural. Um, uh, COVID has, um, has been relatively, uh, uh, well, not, not non-existent, but we're, uh, we're not exactly a hotspot. So, um, that's been that's been welcome. I too will speak a little bit about men, the the mental health uh, aspect. Uh, we we have one full time uh, counselor for our 225 uh, boys. Um, she has actually been working uh, uh, remotely throughout this whole process with with many of the boys that she had been working with before. I think uh, what David was saying too is that. Um, uh, it's very important that that uh, that the, the the communication is transparent. Um, uh, where there's no stigma uh, attached to any of this, uh, we want to help the boys be uh, obviously uh, both physically and mentally healthy. Uh, and um, like most, uh, as David was pointing out, like most schools, we have a very uh, very very good health center that uh, addresses both physical health and uh, mental health. Uh, and uh, we will, uh, we, we suspect that, 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 um, that uh, uh, some of the, or many of the boys who um, uh, have been dealing with some uh, mental health issues will uh, very likely continue to do so. And there will likely be other boys who, uh, given everything that's gone on, uh, will, uh, will need some uh, support as well. And so we're, 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 we're ready to do that. Um, as I said, we're fingers crossed. Uh, based on what we know now, we've, um, uh, and again, like, 
uh, David's, we're, we're um, actively putting our plan uh, in place and we'll be communicating that with our families, both new and returning early next week. Uh, and we'll be happy to share that with, uh, with you uh, and Marie and Rose as well. Thank you very much, Chip. Uh, so I would, I would like to thank all our panelists for your uh, detailed presentations. It's clear that your individual institutions are planning to uh, resume as normal in September. And uh, however, you recognize that, you know, you may uh, need to run uh, online programs alongside face-to-face -face delivery, uh, you know, depending on what uh, the uh, global health situation is. Uh, in that time, um, you, your, your schools, you know, are committed to uh, delivering a strong and balanced uh, academic and co-curricular program for your students. And, uh, you know, we've learned that you all have, uh, you know, you're, you're following public health guidelines uh, and uh, you're, you have in place uh, physical distancing and safety protocols. Uh, to protect your students and minimize, minimize uh, the risk of infection in your school environment. So we're now going to move on to the Q&A session. I've actually been receiving uh, a lot of questions privately, uh, so I'm just going to start off with the first question. Uh, before I do so, um, I'm just going to say I'm not directing the questions at any panelists, so uh, please feel free uh, you know, to say uh, if you would like to answer the question, so any panelists can answer. So the first question is, um, okay, we are all aware of the pandemic's financial impact. Uh, can you confirm if your schools will render financial assistance uh, to families that are unable to afford the full cost of education? Um, and uh, so will families be able to take advantage of merit-based discounts in the form of scholarship or, or needs-based financial aid? Um, and again, anyone can answer this. Oh, okay, I would actually like to say, could we have a panelist uh, representing a school in the US and one representing a school in Switzerland, uh, you know, answer each of the questions? Okay. I can take this one for the okay. U.S. team. Okay, you guys thank want. you. Do you guys don't mind? <laughs> right. So, so yeah, we, as I said, we have 10 high schools, and we, we have been acting, talking to them, and they, they know what's happening in the world. Even our own local students are having difficulties as well. So we have come up with a uh, merit scholarship um, base that is going to help our students that have been affected by COVID, that are going to be affected by travel restrictions, to apply for merit scholarships to one of our high schools. So we still have, and I'm pretty sure that David and Chip, we still have um, spots available for fall 2020. And um, even though it's, you know, it's, it's, people are thinking about 2021, we're still thinking about 2020. So there still have, we still have um, availability for students to apply for scholarships for our fall 2020 um, intake, and as I just mentioned, another another thing that uh, America is doing to help those families is in the near future. So, one that student graduates, we are going to help those families of those students that are perform um, at a higher level at our high schools to apply for a fifteen thousand dollars scholarship when they go to university. So, we're going to be we're going to be picking up the bill uh, for those fifteen thousand uh, dollars when those students apply for university. So, we want to help them before they come and upon arrival with a scholarship, but we're also gonna help them once they graduate uh, because we don't know how long the impact of this COVID is gonna last um, in families, right? So we wanna help them from the beginning through the year and um, towards university. Thank you very much for that, Jessid. Uh, so I, if uh, we could have either Sarah or Jillian uh, you know, um, also provide, uh, you know, the, uh, okay. well, the, support, you okay the financial with that, support that they have in place. <laughs> okay. Um, 
well, every school is different. So certainly uh, at all, I can only speak for our school with regard to the financial situation. But I do, I say every school is different, but I do suspect that everybody is trying to be very flexible and helpful and understanding to families. Um, and certainly uh, with regard to terms of payment, um, normally, for example, in our school, you pay the first two terms before a certain deadline. Um, so we have had families ask about changing the deadline to the payment about instead of paying the first two terms together if they can pay the first term and then have the invoice for the second term a little bit later um, or even to have special staggered payment conditions which are very personal to their situation so that's something that we do as a school and i imagine that lots of other schools are very open to enter into discussions about payment terms um, with regard to scholarships, um, at our school we have a scholarship uh, for 8th and ninth graders. So for a student coming into 8th and ninth grade, we have a scholarship um, to the value of 20%. Uh, so that's a significant amount. It's up to um, 16,000 francs if it's 20%. Um, it's a merit-based scholarship. Uh, so a student who has a special talent, uh, it's on a portfolio, it's with a normal admissions procedure and presentation of a portfolio, um, but we, we do have that scholarship, but we, it's not something that we offer in the higher grades. Um, but certainly we are getting requests with regard to financial flexibility, and that's, that's something we, as I, you know, as I said, I think all the schools are open to. With regard to the school fees for the past term, um, for those students, sorry, I have a little fly that keeps flying in front of me. Um, with regard to this, this term, we, uh, we gave a reduction to the parents. Um, we wrote to all our parents saying, this is the amount that we were prepared to give to, because we understand um, that the students were not getting the full uh, boarding experience. So certain costs, like obviously the food, the laundry, the housekeeping costs, uh, the, the, the non-fixed costs were deducted and we offered a reduction to those families who wanted that. Some of them very kindly um, said, no, you know, we're we giving that to the school, we, we, that's okay. Um, but uh, we gave them the option and I think a lot of the schools um, in Switzerland and probably all around the world had that kind of gesture as well. So we are very sensitive to the financial situation of our families. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, input, Jesse and Sarah. Um, okay, so on the subject of virtual learning, um, I have a question. Um, okay, so this parent wants to know uh, how your current students uh, have uh, adapted to the transition from, you know, the usual uh, education in classrooms to virtual learning. Um, if we could have a uh, share, because I believe uh, I mentioned this after your presentation. So if you could please uh, uh, address this question and then uh, afterwards, if Gillian and George uh, could also answer. Okay. Um, with the virtual learning, immediately um, before even um, the US banned students, we've already started um, planning ahead. And so we've already transferred our students to virtual learning. And so what we did this term is we understand because EF is very international, like I stressed earlier. Um, and we know that, like, you know, even with the lockdown and students going back home, there's going to be the issue of different um, time zone with the learning. So what we've done is we use Google Classroom um, and we've made it more interactive in the sense that you know what, you're going to be away from home and we know that everyone cannot meet the same deadline. So we post um, the assignments and things that they're required to submit and they're required to submit in the Google Classroom um, 48 hours before the deadline. So, so there's a window of 48 hours. So students are flexible. Um, we also had um, um, a survey for both parents and student from this term. And so what that survey brought out, and you know, kids and parents were quite honest. Um, they will tell you what they liked, what they did not like, and how they feel we can improve. So we've taken on those feedback and we've worked on it. 
Um, it's something we're still revising for September when the students um, start. So that's what we've done in terms of um, the virtual learning. In terms of co-curricular as well, we've had some of our co-curricular um, activities done virtually. Um, and it's interesting to see, especially with the um, students who are um, submitting their IB arts. So we had like a showcase of the IB arts um, display. This is something that we normally do on campus, but we, we've had that IB arts display for everyone in every campus to see and everyone take part, of, part in it if you're interested. So it's just the little things of how we can just, you know, bring everybody together and ensure that they at least have something to do other than academics. Um, in reality, some have taken it well um, and some haven't. And the ones that are struggling with the um, adapting to this new virtual way of learning, um, we have pathway managers at EF and we have pathway managers for each region. So that's been a really good advantage for us because we're able to reach out to the parents and reach out to the students and they work with smaller groups. So we know, okay, this person is struggling. Why is this person struggling? We're not just leaving it till the end of term. Um, we're following up on that child and saying, okay, how can we make it better for you? So that's what we've done this term and we hope to improve come September. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Cher. Um, okay, uh, thank you so much for your point on, you know, how you're handling the challenge of different time zones. I mean, as you rightly stated, EF is a very international school. Your student population is represented by multiple uh, countries and nationalities. So, you know, obviously students who went back to their home countries, you know, uh, would experience that challenge of uh, how am I going to be able to do my own work on my own time zone, et cetera. So it's great to hear that, you know, your school took that into consideration uh, uh, in order to accommodate your, your students. Uh, if we could have a Jillian and George from St. George's International School. Oh. So sorry, my, my colleague George had to leave. Um, but oh, that's fine. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we were really very pleasantly surprised about the way that our students have, um, um, have dealt with this situation of, of having a virtual classroom. I think it's gone extraordinarily well. We've had some fantastic feedback. And actually, even before school closed, we already were preempting that this situation was going to happen. And the students already did some sessions um, prior to the school closure um, using Microsoft Teams for the virtual learning platform to understand how it was going to work to do a trial run to make sure that there weren't going to be any technical issues. And then sure enough, when we were ordered to, uh, to close our school, then really from, from the very beginning, the students could hit the ground running. Everybody knew what was going to happen. It was very clear. Um, and it's worked very, very well. I think particularly for the older students, um, they coped a lot better with it. I think for the younger students, um, it's certainly uh, a little bit more challenging. But actually, our students have followed their normal daily timetable. Um, every morning, they've had a check-in with their personal tutor. So for the first 15 minutes of the day, they would attend what we have normally as our, our tutor time. And then they have followed their, their normal timetable um, meeting their different teachers throughout the day and, and checking in with their class as well. But the students have had a five to ten minute break between classes so of course they can get up, stretch their legs, get away from the computer um, because we know that that is, is very important. They've also been doing their usual um, music classes, sports classes, drama, dance. Of course that's had to be a lot more creative. It's not as easy for the teachers to deliver those lessons. Um, but they've been producing music videos um, and doing all kinds of things, really. So I think ultimately it's, it's really been a, a great success um, and we're really pleased um, with how that has worked. The, the, the students have also had, um, you know, one-to-one -one meetings as well um, with the, either the head of senior school or their tutor or their teacher throughout the week just to make sure that everything's going okay and, and, and that they're, they're feeling positive. Um, about their learning. Thank you very much, Gillian. So uh, it's, it's really reassuring to know that your current students, uh, you know, have made that transition, uh, you know, quickly and, you know, seamlessly. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Um, so I would actually like one of uh, the boarding schools in the US uh, 
to answer this. Um, it's with regards to, uh, you know, the protests and, uh, you know, uh, the violence uh, that is currently uh, going on in the U.S. Uh, so we have a parent who is asking how safe America is for her uh, young boys. I can I can take that one to start, and if Chip and Jesse want to add anything, they can. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, for, first of all, obviously, it's a, a very valid concern for parents. I mean, if you're watching the news, that's that's one of the only things that's coming out of the United States in the global news circuit right now. Um, what I will say is, is uh, the demonstrations that are happening are obviously all for a very good cause. And, and uh, as I think as all of our institutions could agree, you know, we're certainly behind uh, the cause of the demonstrations and the reason for them, um, you know, encouraging racial diversity uh, and, and equality and justice for, for everybody in our country. That's obviously what we all want and we share in that, in that sense. Um, on, a safety, on a safety note, um, I can speak for Vermont. Uh, you know, we are an incredibly uh, safe state in general. Um, we don't have large cities anywhere near us. The closest big city to us is Boston, which is three hours away. And, and typically the violence and the, um, the, the sort of animated uh, demonstrations that you're seeing in the news cycle uh, are happening in the larger cities. Um, even within those larger cities, unless you're actively seeking out those demonstrations and actively seeking out the opportunity to go and protest, even if you are seeking out the opportunity to go and protest, you almost you really have to be actively seeking out the violence in order to participate in that or even be affected by it. So um, even though it's very prominent in the news right now, um, those incidents are pretty isolated and, and most of the time uh, limited to uh, you know, middle of the night type of like times and protests that are happening um, later on in, in the day. And um, I know from our, from our perspective, as, a, as the boarding school goes, we, all of our students need to let us know where they're going. So a student has to sign in and sign out of our dormitories with a, with a staff member watching them. Um, there would be no opportunity for a student to be gone for any longer than two to three minutes without a, fa a faculty or staff member saying, where did this student go? They're not signed out. Or um, even if they have, you know, even if they sign out and say they're going one place, um, the, the protests and demonstrations aren't happening in, in an area near us where they could easily go and get involved. So uh, that's a very long way to say, I think your children are more than safe coming to a United States boarding school. Uh, and you, would, you shouldn't have to worry about that being a, a, an issue. And if anyone else wants to jump in, feel free. I'd like to jump in, please. Um, so I've been speaking to a lot of parents. Um, it's really a concern for the African parents, um, the issue of race in America. Um, and with EF, we're very diverse, like I said, and we have a zero tolerance to racism. However, we are aware that, you know, that's not enough. Um, so currently, um, we're re-educating all our staff on how to handle the situation. So for example, even down to even non-teaching staff from the security to just everyone in the campus. And also we have, similar to the EF promise, we have an FAQ that we're sending out to parents um, and to students to reassure them that, you know, at EF we don't tolerate racism and making them aware of the consequences of um, expulsion if found or if you're in that kind of situation. Um, it's also helpful for parents to understand that they can send their child to a place where they are safe. Um, and also they're gonna be well taken care of in terms of mental health and someone to talk about it. Um, I know we're just not leaving it down to, I know Black History Month is a very big thing at EF New York, um, but we're not just limiting um, the talk on race and um, equality just to that week. We're extending it to, you know, every part, you know, there's someone you can reach out to. The Dean has taken on this um, topic um, and just anyone that wants to be educated, anyone that wants to speak about it, or if you're having any issue, it's like a hotline. You have someone that you can report any issue to at EF. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David and uh, Cher. Uh, Chip, I don't know if you uh, had anything that you wanted to add. It, well, I think um, there were the, the two two really good points. Um, one, you know, is that David was saying, like 
um, like St. Johnsbury in Vermont, we're in a very safe environment. We're also working with younger boys. So, um, and they're not, there's, there's, they're not going anywhere from our campus. But the more important thing is, um, uh, uh, is, is just making sure that we're talking about this and addressing this with our students, our faculty, our staff, um, that um, I, I think um, as uh, educational institutions, um, um, we, we can, uh, in working with today's youth, that um, we should be the leaders in, um, uh, in these conversations and, and changing, um, uh, you know, promoting change and um, anti-racism. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a real, um, uh, that's, I think every school um, has come out with some statement in, you know, about, uh, uh, about um, what's gone on and, and how wrong it is and how, but also trying to move forward and promote change um, and promoting change with young kids. I mean, our, our, uh, um, we have a, a pretty diverse environment. We're living together 24 um, seven adults and kids and uh, really talking about these issues and, and um, uh, promoting um, inclusion uh, and, and, and promoting change and where we can, whatever we can do to do that uh, is important. Um, but again, in terms of safety, we feel like we're pretty, pretty safe here in New Hampshire, um, but we're, uh, we're not, you know, we're not isolated from the rest of the world and we really need to be aware of that uh, in our responsibility to, to work with these kids. Thank you very much, Chip. Um, again, uh, uh, well, actually, I was going to say again, this is just for the U.S. boarding schools, but I, I think it will be nice to also hear from Gillian. Uh, so Sarah of Brilliant Mont, uh, you know, touched on uh, the visa application, uh, visa uh, application situation. So, uh, yes, we'd like to hear from um, our American boarding schools with regards to what's happening with uh, 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 visas. So are you aware of visa centers reopening? Are, are visa applications being processed or attended to? Uh, I mean, obviously the timeline as to how quickly uh, visas can be processed, uh, you know, has uh, well, will be uh, impacted uh, by the pandemic. But if we could just have your take on the current situation. I can, I can just um, chime in a little bit. So um, I am I'm based in, in Spain, and um, so we have a large population of students uh, from Spain going to the U.S., and um, it's reopening uh, the first week of August. The United States Embassy in Madrid is opening the first week of August. Um, and they are giving priority to anyone with relatives or anyone that is going to study in the U.S. So it has been, uh, they've been very flexible. Um, you log in, you do all your service, you punch in all your data. And yes, it is true that you're going to get a, you're going to get, um, an appointment probably for November or December. But it's just a matter of having a call with them and saying, right, I am an F1 student. I'm applying for a boarding school in the U.S. And my classes started second week of August, first week of September. And with that said, I'm presenting your acceptance letter. You're going to get an expedited um, appointment. Uh, so we had already six families that had applied. And we have the first two weeks of August are going to be um, busy for us helping our families get to the, get to the embassy and to the documentation. So uh, for those countries that have not opened yet, um, I think that once you see, and, and the way, you know, they work kind of square, so they, the whole consulates and embassies are going to behave, I feel, pretty much the same everywhere. So they're going to give priority to anyone that has a relative in the U.S. that you want to go visit and anyone that is going to study. So that one for us, it benefits us a lot worldwide. Thank um, you so much, Jesse. Mm -hmm. I just yes, want to add fair. to what Jesse um, said. So with us in Nigeria, the embassies are not open. 
um, and with our students, um, you know, we're getting a lot of calls from the parents to just, they just want to know what's happening when, just have an idea of what's happening. Um, so we've been speaking to the embassies, nothing yet. Um, but what we are doing is, you know, we're good. We know it's going to open soon. But what we're trying to do now is get them all the relevant documents and get them ready for the visa application. So the school has already started sending the I-20, um, the admission letter, applying for your visa, just checking and making sure that, you know, you have everything so that even when it opens, they are able to like submit the application and at least get the first few appointments. So that's what we're doing currently here for the Nigerian students and students from Ghana as well. Um, but that's pretty much what we can offer for now. And we're gonna be updating them as we get more information. Thank you very much, Jesse and Shaya. Uh, Julian, I wanted to ask if you had anything to add to what Sarah mentioned about the visa situation for Switzerland. Um, not, not necessarily. I mean, as like Sarah mentioned, um, uh, the visa offices will be reopening next week. Um, we're just hopeful, you know, Switzerland is, is renowned for being an efficient country. So hopefully that helps. You know, there is um, always a lot of international students coming into Switzerland. So we're hopeful that they will, they will prioritise um, those applications. There could be delays. I mean, in which case, if students can't be here for the start of term, then you know, we will work with them to ensure they can join us as soon as they can. Um, so hopeful next week things will start moving again and uh, students will be receiving their visas in time. Thank you very much, Gillian. <laughs> So um, I, I would just like to say a, a big thank you to all our panelists. Uh, thank you for your in-depth presentations. Uh, you know, thank you for addressing uh, the questions and concerns that we uh, have from our parents and students. Um, I'm now going to pass on to the Nubia Education Executive Director, Mrs. Omonobi. Uh, I, th uh, my, I, I believe you're, you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. You can hear me, okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Amari. Um, we just thank God for this um, informative session. I have learned a lot and uh, I'm sure the parents that are listening, listening also have learned so much and their questions have been fully answered. Um, we thank everybody that have taken time to connect. We thank our panelists for, for spending this time with us and our parents, our esteemed parents that have spent this much time listening to uh, to the presentations for the benefit of their words. We thank you so much. We thank you and Maria, your team, the Nubi Education team for putting up uh, this uh, very good event. Um, I just want to point out some things for, for some of our participants. Some of the parents that are listening and the students that are listening, I just want you to know that we can arrange visual uh, meeting with any of our partners that you've listened to today. If you want to talk to them, we can arrange a uh, meeting, virtual meeting with you uh, because it's always good one-on-one. -on -one. It's good for you to, to talk to them about the concerns that you have. Also to let you know that this meeting, this session is recorded. Uh, we are going to be sending the recording to, um, to you all, everyone that has participated and for those that registered and for one reason or the other, they are not able to connect. We will send you the recordings also. And the recordings also will be in Nubi's uh, website for, for those of you that want to go there. 
And then also, um, like I stated when we started, uh, we work in partnership with a bank. And um, if you have a very good job and a good income stream and you're not able to pay your fee upfront, you can approach FCMB, any of their branches. They will, they will be able to assist you uh, with some bridging loans. So uh, I'm not here to tell the modalities because I, I, I don't work in the bank, but this is what they do. They try to assist you and we do this to assist our, our parents as well. So we are, we are very committed maintaining a very honest and enduring relationships with our partners and our parents whose word of mouth has contributed immensely to our success story. And we are happy to be part of your, children, your children's success story as well. So we continue to work together to choose the right school for our children. Thank you very much. And remember that Nubia Education, we are working remotely, but we are still working, working very hard from our homes. And uh, we are ready for you to send in your applications now that you have heard that the US, the Switzerland, they are safe places for you to send your children. So please let's get the applications rolling now. Thank you so much for uh, Thank you very much, Ma. So once again, thank you to our parents, our students, our uh, boarding school representatives for your time today. Uh, it was wonderful uh, gaining insight uh, into all the uh, safety protocols and, you know, um, uh, rolling out of your uh, blended learning approaches that uh, all the schools have in place for the forthcoming term. And we wish you success uh, with all your programs and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank have you. a great day. Bye, Thank David. You. Thank you. Bye, Bye Julia. Thank Bye, you very Sarah. much. Bye, Bye, Bye Marie. Bye, bro. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye, you. <laughs>